Good afternoon and welcome to Grad Slam 2022. We're really happy to have you all here today. My name is Lila Roop. I'm the interim dean of the graduate division and I'll be the host for this afternoon's exciting event. In 2013, our former dean, Carol Gennetti, came up with a brilliant concept for Grad Slam. As you probably all know already, the idea is for students to present the research and its importance in three minutes. When graduate students are going on the job market, we often talk about their elevator speech, how they will describe their research if they run into someone in the elevator who asks, what are you studying? But as you can see from our finalists, these are much more than elevator speeches. And I'm now going to admit in public, not only that I could never have done this myself, as wonderfully as these students will, but it's even worse than that. When I was finishing my dissertation, I had so much trouble talking about what it was that I was doing that I made up a fake title and topic. And uh, the idea was if somebody asked me about my dissertation, I wouldn't tell them even, I would just tell them that I had made up a fake title and topic, and by the time I finished the whole story, they wouldn't even ask me anything more. So I'm not going to tell you any more about it, uh, including the title and topic, but if you press me on this face-to-face, -face, I will come clean. Last year, the pandemic moved us into virtual mode for Grad Slam after having to cancel it entirely the year before. This year, we decided to do the first round virtually with students making videos, since at least some students last year preferred the virtual format to the anxieties of performing live. So our finalists this year are performing in both modes, a unique challenge and great preparation for confronting our increasingly hybrid world. 25 students competed in the qualifying round of Grad Slam. In groups of five, their videos were evaluated by panels of judges from the campus and broader community who were selected to ensure disciplinary diversity. The top two scores from each round, um, each qualifying group became our 10 finalists you'll hear from today. Our grand prize winner will receive $5,000 and our two runners up will each receive $2,500. Audience members, both in person and online, will also have a chance to vote for the People's Choice Award winner, who will receive a $1,500 award. All the students who compete in the final round will take home $750 in prize money. The winner of the final round will also compete in the UC-wide Grad Slam, which will be held on May 6th and hosted by UC President Michael Drake. It's not an easy job judging Grad Slam, and especially when it comes to the exceptional finalists you'll see today. We are grateful to our faculty and community judges for the preliminary rounds and to our illustrious judges for this final round. Dr. Nick, Dr. Nikki Sandoval, Senior Strategic Development Manager at West Ed. Rick Rosen, co-founder of Endeavor and partner at William Morris Endeavor. Ann Tobes, philanthropist and former educator, whose name I proudly carry on my interim title. Dr. Alexandra Siros, screenwriter and author and Heather Hochrein, founder and CEO at EV Match. Our judges are all here in the front row. If we could give them a round of applause. I also want to give big thanks to our donors. They are the ones who made this event possible through their gifts. Not that the intellectual challenge alone would not have drawn students to this competition, but it's very nice for them to have the uh, prize money as well. So big thanks to Yardi, the Lopker Family Foundation, QAD, Drs. Carrie Tobes and John Lewis, BD Biosciences, Boone Graphics, HRL Laboratories, the Santa Barbara Independent, and Samsara Wine Company. We're very grateful to all of you donors. Needless to say, our amazing graduate division staff put endless hours each year into producing Grad Slam. This year required ingenuity to translate our hybrid format, and so many people helped that to mention them all would cut into the program. But a big shout out to all, and especially to Sean Warner, our Director of Professional Development, and Baron Haber, her Assistant Director, our Grad Slam gurus. <laughs> Round of applause. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, to the presentations. Each one will be preceded by a video introduction, and then you'll see the students live on stage. You'll have a chance to pose questions via Twitter to hashtag UCSB Grad Slam, 
or if you're virtual, via YouTube chat. You can ask them as you watch the presentations, and we'll throw at least a few of them out to the students after all the talks are finished and we're waiting for the People's Choice voting. Uh, you'll also have a chance at that point to vote for the People's Choice Award, so please stay tuned for directions. Our first, our first uh, presentation is by Alexandra, excuse me, Alexandra Birch, and I believe we have a video. I'm Dr. Alexander Birch, and I'm in the musicology department. As a performer, I've worked with recovered music from the Holocaust in the USSR for the past 10 years, identifying musical scores in the archive and then performing and recording them. I then became very interested in the tremendous number of intellectuals and artists interned in the Soviet Gulag and the almost complete unfamiliarity with their work. I'm excited to use my language and academic skills to find these suppressed musical works and perform them for new audiences. It's always exciting to work with a new piece of music, particularly that which has never been heard or premiered. I feel that this work is particularly significant as it gives voice to musicians as they imagine themselves, rather than their identity defined by perpetrators. I also promote work by explicitly marginalized and interned peoples, an important consideration with any historically white Western field like classical music. Music also transcends linguistic barriers. So with increasing conflict in the post-Soviet sphere, such performances offer an alternate engagement with difficult topics like the Gulag. Music, Gulag sound, Svevolo Zadratsky's Violin Concerto. I am a professional violinist who finds and records the forgotten music of the dead. Between 1917 and 1960, the Soviet Union deported between 15 and 20 million people to remote, corrective sites of labor collectively known as the Gulag. Among the millions deported, a minority of musicians and composers continued to create artistic works while in detention. Western narratives of anti-Soviet dissidents often cast the Soviet state as a singular monolith against which artists struggled. Rather, a nuanced understanding and reincorporation of these forgotten musical works provides discursive strategies for cultural diplomacy. Music offers a humanizing lens to discuss difficult topics such as the gulag and detention in an increasingly complicated and politically fraught post-Soviet sphere. I have recovered one such work by a Gulag composer, Sevolod Zedratsky, a Ukrainian pianist. He composed the Violin Concerto in the last year of his life in 1953. He was, however, arrested and deported to the Gulag in Magadan, which is pictured here. With any violin concerto or any presentation on music, it's nice to hear a bit. So let me play for you now the first theme of the first movement of Sevolod Zedratsky's Violin Concerto. I'd also like to play for you the second movement of Sebola Zedaratsky's Violin Concerto, which includes Orientalist elements, elements like turns or expressive runs, evocative of his time in the Siberian Far East.
Music and the arts have the potential to simultaneously educate and commemorate. My research gives voice to the forgotten composers and affected peoples of the Gulag to know, remember, condemn, and ultimately forgive. Thank you. My name is Crystal Vo, and I am from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I am a single mom, and I moved here from Georgia to Santa Barbara when I was six months pregnant. This journey is important for me to inspire those who feel discouraged and for them to know that they can get through anything in life if they follow their gut and do the next right thing with courage and persistence. This is the message I want to teach my daughter and I hope to teach her by example. The best experience here has been creating my own story and paving a new path for myself and for my daughter. Meeting the characters of my story, the many people who supported me and forever changed my life for the better. I am extremely grateful and know that I couldn't have made this far without them. I had people I had just barely met help me in the most humbling ways and I am just amazed by their kindness and generosity. I am especially grateful for my mom who made my edu this educational experience possible for me. So thank you. And now presenting Crystal Vo, Chemistry and Biochemistry, the Photochemistry of Pigments. Pigments produce an assortment of colors, but their color isn't the only thing that makes them unique from one another. Certain pigments fade more easily than others. Take, for instance, this painting by Van Gogh. Originally, he painted the walls purple, which is a mix of red and blue pigments. Over time, the red pigment faded, leaving what you see as the blue pigment. So why do certain pigments fade more easily than others? The answer is in its photochemistry. I study indigo dye, which is a blue pigment. Before indigo is exposed to the sun's UV radiation, it is in the ground state, which is low energy and in a stable form. When it is exposed to the sun's UV radiation, it absorbs that light energy and goes into an excited state, which is high in energy. But being high in energy makes it unstable. It needs to go through an intermediate state and return back to the ground state, back to its stable form. The faster it can go through this process, the more resistant the pigment is to fading. But pigments aren't the only thing that goes through this process. I also study the building blocks of DNA, which makes up life on Earth. 
Like indigo dye, when DNA is exposed to sunlight, it can go through this process so fast to avoid sun damage. I also study modified versions of DNA building blocks. These have been believed to have existed way before life on Earth and were even found on meteorites. So why aren't they found in our DNA? The difference is that it goes through the process too slow, so it is prone to sun damage. That's why it is not found in our DNA. I use tools called spectroscopy to study these fast processes by using ultra-fast lasers to study these extremely fast processes. So why is this important? It is the study of photochemistry that allows us to understand why things like pigments and DNA can survive under the sun's UV radiation and allow for color and life to exist on this beautiful planet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alyssa Lawson, and I am from the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. My research is focused on how to create a more effective learning experience for students. I am passionate about teaching, so this is an extremely rewarding experience because I get to take my research findings and apply them to my own classroom. I love seeing students use the strategies that I investigate in the research to develop deeper understandings of the material we cover. One challenge I face with my research is trying to figure out how to balance cognitively what is best for learning with what is fun and motivational in learning. Sometimes what is best cognitively for students can be boring and not motivate students to want to learn, but also sometimes lessons with a lot of fun aspects can be overwhelming to students' cognition. So it really is a balancing act to focus on both of these dimensions in instructional design. I think the one thing that would surprise people to know about me is that for my entire life, I have lived no further than an hour drive from the beach. Despite always living near the ocean, I don't particularly like sand or salt water. Additionally, even though I've lived in California on the coast for almost my entire life, I have never tried to surf. And now, Alyssa Lawson, Psychological and Brain Sciences, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Investigating the positivity principle in learning. Before I begin today, I want everyone to take a second to think about the answer to this question. What factors make up an effective instructor? When I ask people this question, Oftentimes, the things that I hear are smart, 
challenges your thinking, presents information well, or other similar ideas. And yes, these are factors that make up an effective instructor. But I don't usually hear answers like a happy instructor or an instructor who exudes positive emotion as they teach. Oftentimes, cognitive factors, like what an instructor says, are a top priority in educational research. However, my research is focused on the idea that it is equally important to think about affective factors, like emotion, in teaching and learning. Specifically, I am interested in how an instructor's displayed emotion can influence student learning. This is based on the positivity principle, the idea that the positive or negative emotional tone of an instructor can influence the experience a student has in class and thus influence their learning. In a series of studies I conducted, participants watched a video lecture of an instructor talking about a statistics lesson on binomial probability. Through her voice and gesture, the instructor displayed either a positive emotion, like happy or content, or a negative emotion, like bored or frustrated. A week later, participants took a test on this material, rated their perception of the instructor's emotion, rated their own emotion felt during the learning, rated their social connection with the instructor, and rated their motivation to pay attention and learn more. I found that students are sensitive to the emotions displayed by an instructor, so students can tell when an instructor is happy and content or when an instructor is bored and frustrated. Additionally, students mirror the emotions of their instructors, so positive instructors influence students to be more positive. Positive instructors also develop better social connections with their students, which benefits motivation. High motivation is a key factor in learning because those who are highly motivated to pay attention to come back to class are often the students that develop a better understanding of the material and thus do better in class. So what does this mean? When you are preparing for the next time that you teach, instead of just thinking what you are going to say, think about how you might say it. Give emotions the credit they deserve in student learning because positive instructors benefit learning. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tabruna Shulke, and I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology Department. We all grow up learning about climate change and how we should take better care of our planet. But the extent of this threat really became clear to me when I taught environmental science at a high school in Washington, D.C. after completing my undergraduate studies. I got especially worked up as I realized that all of us, including myself, are contributing clim to climate change. But I realized that I could also be part of the solution and not just the problem. 
So that's when I decided that any research I work on must focus on understanding and solving challenges related to climate change. And that's why today I study marine algal blooms and how they impact the ecology of our oceans. I especially feel fortunate to be doing this work with Dr. Lizzie Wilbanks because of her depth and range of knowledge. She's a great chemist, ecologist, microbiologist, and a fantastic computational biologist. And this is an exciting project to collaborate on together. One thing people would be surprised to know about me is that even though I'm quite small, I can drive a regular city bus. And I learned how to do that at UC Davis as an undergrad. If you've ever been to the Davis campus, you may have seen big red buses around town and on campus that are operated by a student-run company called Unitrans. And one day I woke up and thought, well, let's see what happens if I apply to be a bus driver with Unitrans. And lucky for me, they hired me and trained me to, do, to be just that. And I remember people all often got concerned or surprised when they learned that I was their bus driver. But I always got them from point A to point B safely, and I met my husband along the way. And now Taruna Shoki, Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology, Runaway Seaweed. The largest seaweed bloom we've ever seen shows no signs of stopping. Over the last decade, a seaweed called sargassum has been blooming every year in the Atlantic Ocean, stretching from West Africa all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. This runaway seaweed is bad news because when dead sargassum washes ashore, it, smother marine, it smothers marine animals to death, and cities in the Caribbean spend millions of dollars cleaning up decaying seaweed from their beaches. So what's going on here? Some theories point to human activity and climate change. As Brazil deforests the Amazon to make more room for farming, more fertilizer and pollutants drain into the Atlantic Ocean. Additionally, as global temperatures rise, larger dust clouds from the Sahara Desert move across the Atlantic likely dumping excess nutrients into the ocean. But some of these nutrients don't have the correct chemical composition needed for sargassum to consume them. Take iron in the Sahara Desert dust clouds, for instance. This iron is insoluble, and thus sargassum can't use it for photosynthesis and growth. But somehow, sargassum is still able to exploit and benefit from this iron. But how? One way might be through the help of microbes that are found on sargassum itself. Let me explain. We all eat food to get nutrients, right? But it's really the microbes in our guts that help us pull those nutrients out from our food and into our bodies. In a similar way, sargassum is covered with microbes that may help glean and process nutrients from the seawater for their host. My research focuses on these microbes and their role in nutrient cycling. So if we think back to our insoluble iron example, my data show that some microbes living on sargassum can actually grab onto this iron and may even bring it to sargassum on a silver platter. I'll conclude by saying that as our climate changes, our coastlines will only continue to become more susceptible to blooms like this. Having a deeper understanding of all the physical and biological factors behind these blooms has important implications for the health of our oceans and the strength of local economies that are impacted by these blooms like the cities in the Caribbean today. With my work, I hope that one day we can figure out a way to catch these runaway seaweeds before they get away. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Meng Wen Lee and I'm from Molecular, Cellular and Developmental Biology Department. I'm currently a fifth year PhD student in Dr. Craig Montel's lab. So I'm really interested and curious about animal behaviors. For example, like the topic I'm gonna present today is about sleep. So sleep is a behavior that conserved among different species. For example, like my cats, they sleep 20 hours a day. And for humans like us, we sleep maybe about eight to 12 hours a day. And this is because sleep is very important for cognitive function, memory formation and metabolism and et cetera. So speaking of my favorite experience in UCSB is that the window of our lab is open to the ocean so we can see through. So it's really a gift for us to see dolphin jumps and whales, which is really awesome. Please welcome Meng Lin Lee, Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology, Sleep Chronotype from Fruit Flies to Human. Here's a photo of my two cats sleeping. The elder boy sleeps almost 20 hours a day, but the younger girl never gets tired. And I can feel her steps right on my face even during midnight. And you may also notice that some of us prefer to work during night, have midnight snacks, and won't get up until noon of next day. We can call people who have these activity patterns as night owls or wolves, or to say they have an evening chronotype. There are also some of us who are early risers and prefer earlier night bedtimes. We can call them larks or lions, or to say they have a morning chronotype. Some of us prefer to have a nap during afternoon, like bears, and some of us prefer uh, some of us are light sleepers, like dolphins. These are all different sleep chronotypes. We specifically focus on the evening chronotype because evening chronotype in humans are correlated to a lot of health risks. For example, like sleep disorders, cognition defects, men cognition defects, mental illness, and so on. So it's critical for us to know the reason that cause evening chronotype. So in our lab, we use fruit flies to study this question. You may be surprised, but they do sleep. And here's a figure showing their specific posture during sleep. So my lab mate, Jeff Meyerhoff, who is also presenting today, and I are able to identify a protein, called, uh, a protein in the eye of fruit flies that is important for studying chronotypes. And to monitor their sleep, we put individual flies in tubes and with an infrared beam in the middle of the tube that can record their crosses. So the left bottom figure here showing their sleep profile every 30 minutes throughout the day. So compared with the wild type flies, which have normal sleep peaks in the middle of daytime and after lights off, these mutant flies in red show an evening, peak, evening chronotype with delayed sleeps after lights on and lights off. So the wild type flies have very similar circadian rhythm period, like us, which is 24 hours. However, we found these mutant flies have a way longer periodicity than the normal flies. And more interestingly, when we put them under extended circadian environmental lighting cues, which now align with their internal periodicity, which is 28 hours, they now have normal timings of wake up and sleep. And this alignment even extended their lifespan compared to misalignment conditions. So why is it important to study this problem in fruit flies? These proteins we found in fruit flies are actually very similar to a group of proteins called melanopsins in the eye of humans. So to study this question in fruit flies, we hope to provide more insights on sleep chronotypes and hope to promote people, human health so we can sleep better in the near future. Thank you.
I'm Skylar Palatnik. I'm a first year grad student in the physics and astronomy department. So I do a combination of exoplanets and optics research and what got me interested in that goes all the way back to when I was a kid and I was super enthused by space and animals and I think most people when they think aliens imagine uh, humanoid or super intelligent species but for me I was just super excited to think about animals like, like alien lizards or alien bears that could be on other planets. And that kind of evolved into a more general interest in planets and going into undergrad I knew it was something I wanted to explore and research. So when I got involved as an undergrad, I, I immediately loved it and knew it was something that I would want to continue as a grad student. But on the other side, I was really interested in doing things hands-on and uh, building devices. So to that effect, I, I actually did a master's after I graduated undergrad in nanotechnology engineering, where I learned how to build really tiny devices. And I love that too. Uh, so when I was coming to UCSB, I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to blend these two seemingly different interests together. But when I got talking with my advisor and discussing the, the idea of building uh, fancy optical devices to, to detect planets or to help our ability to detect planets, I knew that was something that I would want to do. And since I've started, I've been loving it. So I guess something people might not expect uh, to know about me is that I'm a competitive boxer. And uh, I started when I was 10. My mom actually got me into it because she didn't want me getting picked on at school. And it started just as a, a way to stay in shape and get involved in sports. But eventually, I really took a liking to it. And now it's become one of my big passions. And I was actually the, the captain of my undergrad team. And it's been a great way to, to meet a lot of very interesting new people, also to stay in shape, of course, and uh, to, to make new friends, to, to learn how to kind of be disciplined and uh, apply yourself to something and uh, something that I've been continuing in Santa Barbara. And now presenting Skylar Palatnik Physics, Im Imaging Exoplanets with Metasurfaces. What do you get when you combine advanced optics, nanotechnology, and exoplanet observation? You get metasurfaces. You might not know what any of those words mean, but when I'm done explaining them, you'll be as excited as I am for the prospect of using metasurface optics to image exoplanets. So what are exoplanets? These are planets that orbit any star other than the sun. We found thousands, and motivating this search is the desire to find Earth 2.0, or another planet that can host life. Once we find this planet, the best way to understand its atmosphere, and thus what might be going on on the ground, is through direct imaging, which involves blocking out the light from a star so we can see the planets orbiting it. This is why in the simulated image on the left, you can see a big black circle where a star would be. But you'll also notice that this image is incredibly noisy and has lots of aberrations. We'll never see Earth 2.0 at this rate. To do so, we need to improve our current systems, and one such way to do that is with metasurfaces. Metasurfaces are arrays of nanoscale structures that can transmit or reflect light, changing the size, the shape, the orientation, or the material of a particular nanostructure changes just how it manipulates light. And if you take thousands of these structures with different sizes, shapes, and orientations and distribute them in a particular pattern across a surface, you can manipulate light that goes through that surface in a way that is the combination of all the individual manipulations from each nanostructure. An example of the power of this tool is shown here in the form of a metasurface with an arrangement that can take an incoming signal and separate the different wavelengths or colors, sending them in different directions. Because the properties of the structures on a metasurface are so fine-tunable, you can achieve control that's unrivaled by conventional optics. And this is great for direct imaging, where you need every bit of control you can get to resolve objects as faint as Earth-sized planets. So my research focuses on integrating these devices into direct imaging systems. This has never been done before, as metasurfaces have never been used in astronomy at all, to my knowledge. So everything I'm doing is brand new, and I'm designing, testing, and hopefully implementing three devices that will improve or simplify current imaging systems. The first is a metasurface that will correct for aberrations too small for conventional optics to correct, but still negatively impactful to our imaging abilities. The second is a metasurface that will block starlight as well as convert the signal into one easier for computers to process, thus simplifying current systems by performing multiple functions at once. And it'll do this while operating with better performance than conventional tools. And the final application is a metasurface that will take an incoming signal 
and split it into four separate wavelength ranges, sending each to a different part of a detector so that we can image a planet in multiple wavelengths simultaneously, but independently. Together, these applications will serve to introduce these fascinating devices to the field of astronomy, uh, so they hopefully can be used in the future. And I hope that you guys are now as excited as I am to see that happen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sienna McKim. I'm a first year PhD student in the Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology Department. In my independent research project as an undergraduate, I discovered a new species of diatom, which is a microscopic algae in the local lakes of northern Michigan. I never thought I would be someone who could find a new species because I thought new species were rare. But I then realized we know so little and new species are all around us hiding in plain sight. I always knew I wanted to study the small and underdescribed. So sponges and especially organisms that live in sponges were a perfect match for my interests. For my research, I have to sit in the lab for long periods of time dissecting tiny crustaceans. I'm usually not that patient, but my research has made me grow in ways that I didn't expect. Feeling like I'm giving attention to organisms nobody really cares about makes me feel like I'm uncovering secrets. That's really rewarding. <laughs> However, the amount of species that I still don't know is intimidating and sometimes makes me feel like I'm an imposter and that my work is pointless. I've learned to how to counter these thoughts because I know the work is valuable and I have my whole life ahead of me to learn. Please welcome Sienna McKim, Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology, Sponges, Local Alien Apartments. I want you to imagine a place where we're still discovering species today. You may be thinking of the Amazon or Antarctica, but there are many ecosystems right here in Santa Barbara where we're discovering species every year. One ecosystem I'm interested in is inside of one of the oldest animals on our planet. They don't have eyes, a brain, a nervous system, or even a heart, but they've survived every mass extinction. I'm talking about sponges. There are over 100 species of sponges in California that are undescribed. And within each one of those are thousands of little known organisms. Similar to our own microbiome, where we have mites that clean the dead skin off of our faces, sponges also have these inhabitants. One animal that lives inside of sponges are a group of crustaceans called amphipods. Amphipods have unique ways of living outside of sponges. They can create silk from their bodies like spiders. And with this silk, 
They can create a city of tubes that they live in. What amphipods do inside of sponges and what role they play, we don't know. And in fact, we don't even know what sponges themselves do in the kelp forest. It's said that we know more about space than we do our own oceans. That's why studying what's inside of sponges feels more foreign than extraterrestrial life. In my research, I'm studying these local alien apartments. To do this, I scuba dive down to the bottom of the kelp forest and collect these colorful sponges. Then take them back to the lab and tease apart their bodies to find amphipods. Carefully, I dissect the amphipods under microscopes to identify them. This is the first step in a long journey in understanding sponge amphipod relationships. What part of the kelp forest story are we missing by ignoring this relationship? Although this relationship and this alien world feels so disconnected to the human experience, biology is not human-centric. And there's a misconception that marine biology is driven by large, charismatic animals. But those small, unassuming relationships in our own backyard may be the most important. Sponges have been around long before us and will likely persist long after we are gone. By studying sponges, we study the past, present, and future of life on our planet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Esther Showalter. I'm in computer science. So I like using the internet, and my life for the past two decades has depended on having a good internet connection. Um, and, but if you want to live anywhere remotely rural or do any significant amount of traveling, you just can't depend on where you're going to have good access and what the quality of that access is going to be. So I wanted to understand what motivates the, this, its political and economic um, influences that allow infrastructure buildup. Um, but that brings up the question of what we do online, what ways could we have of interacting digitally with one another that does not depend on having electricity infrastructure um, or connectivity back to some central internet server. Uh, so it brings up a lot of questions of how we want to use the internet in a way that serves us locally, not just in terms of being connected to the entire world. So I love languages, but I cannot for the life of me trill my R's, which was not a problem in my life until I moved to Southern California. And I can't even say burrito properly, so I have to huff it all out in a big gust of air. Burrito! Uh, which does not come over well at the Takierias, so uh, it's been a problem.
Esther Showalter, Computer Science. Your connection is unstable and owed to internet improvisers. Your connection is unstable. Feel the shivers down your spine as your Zoom call gets all garbled. Do you panic? Whimper? Whine? As someone who's done all of the above, when my internet just dies, I can guarantee there is one thing you all do, and that thing is improvise. You restart the call, or you reboot, reboot your router, or uh, uh, try on your phone, or call your provider. Lobby your government. Get them to lay down more cable, more fiber, more towers, more sats. Build better broadband maps, better coverage maps, better infrastructure. And all that is how you stabilize. But what about if you improvised more? My lab facilitates internet improvisation. Sometimes what that means is anticipating cellular congestion, or sometimes it's airborne hotspots deployed in natural disasters, or mimicking tree biology to help wireless nodes talk faster, or teaching machines how to recognize hate speech, or streaming TV to the edges of space, or checking that cellular service providers are actually delivering the speeds that they claim. These genres of research explore the far edges of the intricate orchestra that makes up the net. And when your connection goes unstable, that flings you right out there with us on the crumbling edge. So if we're all dangling by a thread, by a cord, then maybe this orchestra is just not quite doing it for us. Maybe the genre of network we need should be a little bit more extemporaneous. Maybe the internet should be more like folk rock with polka connections and hotspots of soul. The point is that all of these genres arise when you bring people together to improvise. To do this, my work, let's call it, is, does instrumentation. It's not so mystical. It's all statistical. I collect tests of poor network performance, and with a large enough sample size, I hypothesize that I can distill complex networking metrics down into a set of intuitive gut checks to build into tools you can pick up like tunes to run diagnostics that you can then use to show you just where your flow is incomplete, to then adjust and adapt your own beat whenever your connection goes unstable. So the next time your Wi-Fi dies, let's band together. Let's improvise. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophia Bailey. I'm part of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at UCSB. 
and I conduct research in organic synthetic chemistry applied to polymaterials. I got excited about this research in undergrad where I got to uh, perform organic research in um, developing methodology. And I've been really excited to apply this work in my PhD research where I'm now applying it to innovative materials and uh, the synthesis of polymers. The project I'm going to present today is actually inspired from a really fun collaboration we have with biologists and I can't wait to share it with you all. And then I think one of the most exciting parts of being in grad school here in Santa Barbara has been getting to experience the amazing environment that surrounds us. So I've got to go on some wonderful backpacking trips on my weekends, which has been absolutely wonderful. Please welcome Sophia Bailey, Chemistry and Biochemistry, Fake It Till You Make It, Developing Chemistries to Advance Biomimetic Materials. Fake it till you make it. This is a phrase I think a lot of us are intimately familiar with, and basically what I'm doing up here on the Grad Slam stage. But in the field of biomimetic materials, where we're making materials to imitate life, this is exactly what we're doing. So here's a case where we're faking it and not yet making it, and that's the recreation of natural tissues. In a natural tissue, you have this beautiful spatial organization of cell types, and these materials are dynamic, so they change over time as cells grow. Our synthetic versions of this are hydrogels. These are like your contact lenses. They're made out of polymers that love water, so they readily swell up, making materials that are high water content and super squishy, just like us. But even though they share these properties, they're bioinert, so they can't communicate to our cells, they're completely homogeneous in composition, and they're not dynamic. So when you try to grow cells on these materials, the cells don't behave like they're supposed to. This is a huge problem when you're trying to understand cell processes and in the development of therapeutics, like stem cell therapies, where you have to culture cells outside of the human body. To solve these, this problem, scientists and engineers are working to develop new materials that better mimic natural tissues. My part in this is developing chemistries to synthesize these materials. And one specific goal of my work is to use chemistry to mimic the spatial complexity of these natural tissues. But when we do chemistry, this is typically like in a flask and everything in there has a pretty equal chance of reacting. So how would you gain the spatial control? The exciting answer to that question is the use of light. I've designed photoresponsive molecules that only react upon light exposure, so you can control the location of your chemistry based on where you shine the light. What we've been able to do is pattern common structural proteins, like collagen, in very precise locations like this itty-bitty UCSB logo, where each of these letters is only about the width of a human hair. We're now patterning complex molecules that can communicate to cells, and we're hoping these materials will better the understanding of cell behavior in complex spatial environments, and will contribute to future therapeutics. So, I'm starting to think that these materials might just be making it more than they're faking it. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Jeff Meyerhoff, and I am in the Department of Biomolecular Sciences and Engineering. One cool thing about the research I'm doing is that it's provided an opportunity uh, to collaborate uh, both with other um, grad students and with other uh, postdocs, all working on super different um, projects. And one thing I'm really excited about with Grad Slam is that uh, someone I'm collaborating with, Mong Lin Lee, uh, is now also a finalist uh, in this competition. So that's been a lot of fun uh, working together on this project and then um, now both being part of this experience. One thing people might be surprised to know about me is that I did not own any spoons my first two years of grad school. It was just uh, two forks and a knife. And now please welcome Jeff Myroff, Biomolecular Science and Engineering. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. What simple organisms can teach us about our daily rhythms. I have a friend <laughs> I have a friend that stays up way too late watching Netflix and eating snacks. This same friend cannot for the life of him make it to his morning meetings on time, no matter what he tries. We'll call this person friend A. But on the flip side, my other friend, friend B, is just the opposite. This guy effortlessly falls asleep at 9.30 every night to make it to his oppressively early 8 a.m. class with 15 minutes to spare. Now, the reason these two friends are different might have nothing to do with their respective levels of discipline or effort. Instead, it could be that they have different circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are the natural 24-hour cycles our body produces to align our sleep, eating, and alertness with the rising and setting of the sun. And unfortunately for night owls, most of society operates on an early bird schedule. In fact, there's a growing body of research showing that people with night owl tendencies tend to have much lower grades in school, and that night shift workers have much higher rates of diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. What I study in the Craig Montel lab are the genes that regulate differences in circadian rhythms. And in particular, I study genes in the eye that affect these rhythms. So now the eye has two functions. The first is vision from the rods and cones, and the second is to reset the clocks in our brain each day to light. And this comes from the ganglion cells. Now, these clocks in our brain are the reason that we can often wake up at the same time each morning, even without setting an alarm clock. And they're the reason that when we fly across the country to a new time zone, we get jet lagged. So it turns out the way the rods and cones sense light and the way the ganglion cells sense light is totally different. In fact, compared to the rods and cones, ganglion cells sense light in a way that's much more similar to how the fruit fly eye senses light. So to study the role of the eye in circadian rhythms, I use the fruit fly. I and my lab mate, Mong Lin Lee, whom we've just heard from, have identified a fly eye protein that when mutated, transforms the fly into a night owl. As a second example of this transformation, here I'm showing their daily feeding. On top in blue is a normal fly, and you can see that it does most of its feeding directly before the transition from daytime to nighttime. And on bottom in red is our eye protein mutant, and unlike the normal fly, it feeds well into the night. Whether it also likes Netflix is unclear, but at least the night owl has someone to share dinner with. With these insights from the fly, we hope to one day be able to apply our findings to humans. The ganglion cells in the human eye have a protein that's super similar to the one we're studying here in the fly. By controlling this protein, we may one day be able to reset our circadian clocks at will, eliminating the ill effects of shift work and allowing us to keep whatever schedule we please. Thank you. That was our last presentation, so let's give a big round of applause to all of our finalists. <laughs> this is not going to be an easy job for the judges. You all still have a few minutes to send questions, and um, now we have time to vote for the People's Choice Award.
You can vote by scanning the QR code on the screen with your phone's camera. While you're doing that, I'm going to ask all the present presenters to come back on stage so I can pose the questions that you all have asked in the meantime. So I'll have all the um, presenters come back up and stage. But Carlos, I do have a slight glitch. I don't have any questions here. Do we have some questions from the audience? Aha. Okay. Crystal, does your research on color pigments and light have any impact on improving the efficiency of solar panels? Um. Understanding the complex mechanism of different molecules give us the fundamental understanding of the photochemical process. Um, so it indirectly helps us understand more of the chemistry behind uh, solar panels. More technological glitches here, sorry. Well, I'll go to Esther. Um, what are some of the ways that we can improve networks to help with unreliable connections in remote areas far away from large towns and cities? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm trying to figure out. So the most, if, uh, not efficient, but the most reliable way to get it done is to lobby for funding to extend infrastructure some way. Uh, and there's been uh, enormous spending by the US government to support small, uh, small startups or um, um, some community-run networks, but infrastructure development in underconnected areas. Um, one interesting challenge on the side of that is that it's very difficult to explain where is underconnected and where is not underconnected. Uh, so in terms of things that you can do now, if you look up community networks and uh, read about them, that it's a uh, a sub, uh, a small community of people that's growing, uh, that's looking up good answers to this question. Um, uh, but it's, it's one that I hope to be answering better in about six months from now. Great, thank you. Um, Alyssa, how can we motivate teachers to implement positive psychology techniques in their classrooms? I love that question. Um, so the thing that I think could motivate teachers to try to implement positive emotion in their classroom is to focus on what in their teaching excites them. We, we think that maybe, you know, if you're, in a if you're in a classroom, think about it. If an instructor is kind of fake and giving you this fake smile, fake, you know, happiness, you're probably going to be kind of distracted by it because it's weird. Um, so having this genuine positivity, the genuine excitement about the material that you're teaching really is a way to get your students to also feel that. If you, you know, exude that, you know, exude that emotion towards your students, they, like, we, like you saw in the presentation, that's what they will feel. So uh, genuine positivity. Be excited about your teaching. That's, I think, the best way to go about it. Great. Thank you. Um, Taruna. Um, you stated that in the future you hope to capture the seaweed before a bloom occurs. What things can be done with this type of seaweed after capturing them? Maybe biofuels. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, that's actually whoever asked that question already answered it. Yes, biofuels. 
um, are a great way. In fact, the sargassum bloom, the people who are most impacted by it in the Caribbean, are trying to use sargassum as a fertilizer um, and also use it to produce you know, renewable energy sources. So that's a great way. But I think the real problem is how do we stop them from even becoming runaways, right? But um, there are great potentials in um, seaweeds, which you know, are under the umbrella of macroalgae, and they're a great resource for renewable energy. So yeah, that's what we can do with them if we can't control them. Great, thank you. Um, Mengling, this is a question I think we're all gonna wanna hear the answer to. Sometimes my sleeping cycle doesn't line up perfectly with the standard day. What types of treatments can be developed from your research to help people like me? Yeah, I, uh, so I found that some of uh, the people, they have these patterns is because they are forced to uh, match their activities to what the daily rhythm of like, for, for example, like classes or entertainment that other people are doing. So then you will have a, a poor quality because you, you, if you are evening chronotype, but you force yourself to match the other morning chronotype people's activity, then um, you, you, you have to have like a poor quality of sleep. So um, one way to do that maybe uh, is to um, have your own um, rhythm and then uh, also like the light therapy could be a solution um, by matching your rhythm instead of like the normal uh, sunrise and sun, sunset. Yeah. Great, I think. thank you. Um, Skylar. What are some of the coolest celestial entities you photographed or imaged? So that is a very fun question. And I have not been able to image too many things yet because I'm only a first year grad student, but I've looked at one object called a brown dwarf, which is basically, you could think of it as either a really successful planet or a failed star in that it's a little bigger than a planet, so like a couple times the mass and size of Jupiter, but it doesn't look like a giant ball of fire like a star. And uh, I looked at those on a project with my advisor where we were trying to understand the, uh, the cloud patterns on it. And actually in about two weeks, I will look at another one of those uh, right on the border between a brown dwarf and a planet. And uh, this one's really cool because it's just zipping around its star going super fast. And it's also rotating around its own axis super fast. So it's got some crazy cloud patterns and hopefully we'll be able to learn something cool about it too. Great, thank you. Um, Sienna, did you get to name the species you discovered? Oh yeah, the diatom, um, I did. <laughs> I'm not like super into naming species after people, so I just named it in Sinopsis Ophridiensis. And Ophridiensis means inside Ophridium. And so Ophridium was the, um, this jelly blob, like group of protozoa, which is not an animal or not a plant. And this diatom lived in the mucus of this Ophridium colony. And so I was like, yeah, it's inside of this Ophridium. I'm going to name it after that and just like really highlight that relationship between this protozoa and this diatom. Great, thank you. Um, Sophia, uh, how did your lab make that microscopic collagen tattoo with the UCSB logo? Excellent question. So uh, what we ended up doing, this is part of the collaboration with MCDB and my collaborator Eric and I have been preparing to basically make these little gels out of collagen so you can prep these and people typically grow, grow cells on them. And we treat them with the molecules I've designed. And then you use a microscope to shine light in the little itty bitty UCSB logo. And we pattern that, the way it's imaged is with a fluorescent dye. So using my chemistry, the little triangle in the figure would be the fluorescent dye that we clicked onto it. Um, and that's what we were able to image. Okay, and finally, Jeff. Um, we're, uh, I'm just going to ask this question. Um, how Are you a night owl or a morning lark, and do you wish you were something different? Oh, uh, yeah. So I am an extreme morning lark, actually. Uh, yes. And, you know, I'm pretty happy with it. So no complaints. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks to all of you. And you can return to your seats. And, um, again, another round of applause for everybody. Thank you.
oh, this is going to be so hard. I don't know how you're going to decide. Um, okay, so we are, I think, ready for the results. Um, I'd like to invite Logan Kozal, who's last year's winner of Grad Slam, to join me on stage to present the prizes. Logan? Oh my God, we actually have an envelope. Uh, do we have a drum roll? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. When I announce your name, please come up and Logan will present your award. First of all, the People's Choice goes to Skylar Palatnik. We have two runners up, and these are um, in alphabetical order. Sophia Bailey. And Alyssa Lawson. champion is Jeff Meyerhoff. What an exciting afternoon. I want to just end with some thank yous. Thank you again to our judges and our sponsors. We're very grateful we couldn't do this without you. I would like to thank our grad division staff, and I would like to get everybody up on stage who was part of the Grad Slam, particularly Sean and Barron. Can you all come up and get a, a little round of applause? There she is. Carlos, get out here. Robert. These are the people who make this possible. Thank you. Yay. And Thank you to our enthusiastic audience, both in-house and virtual, for being here this afternoon. Um, but again, most of all, thanks to our fabulous finalists. One more round of applause. So don't forget to tune in to the UC-wide competition. You can see how Jeff does. You can cheer him on. And you can vote in the People's Choice Award in that competition as well. So please have a wonderful evening thinking about how much you have learned about so many things in 10 three-minute segments. I hope you feel as cheered as I do by the brilliance and passion of our graduate students. Thank you for coming. Thank you.